We're still in Matthew. We are zooming in on um, getting Matthew wrapped up. But speaking of which, I, I hope you all can appreciate the reason why we started off kind of in Matthew, because Jesus in, is in the Olivet Discourse is addressing some very specific timing issues with Matthew. So what I wanted to settle for our, our minds is um, some of the differences out there in the world today, um, especially in maybe some of the circles we travel, um, you know, all millennialism, um, post-tribulation, that kind of thing. So hopefully we can get settled in everybody's minds that, okay, for instance, uh, this did not happen, this tribulation the book of Revelation does not happen in 70 AD. So hope we all have established now in our minds that it's a future type of event, right? So now the question comes up because of where we are in, in um, Matthew 24, we're at the point that, that we call, uh, it's called different things. Your Bible might say different, way, different things. It'll say maybe the fig tree uh, parable. Sometimes it'll say the fig tree generation. What do some of yours, your Bibles say down there? Like where? Like the, lesson about, of the, fig tree. the lesson of the fig tree. What does that start? In the, hmm? 27, 28? 30, oh, 30, 30, 32 on oh, yours. Parable. Sometimes parable. they back up a little bit. Parable for yours says parable. Yeah, parable. I've seen that. Parable. Yeah, yours doesn't say anything. Parable. Good. You don't have notation for yours. Well, little headings. The oh, the lesson of the fig tree. Yeah, that's what yours says, isn't it, Larry? Yeah, yeah, lesson of the fig tree. Yeah. So, so uh, what, I, what I propose to do is, here's my idea, is um, some of you attended uh, the first Sunday of the new year, and Pastor Greg, for instance, uh, addressed the fig tree, the fig tree generation, and some of his ideas on it. And uh, what I'm going to be sharing is kind of a slightly different angle on it, and it's probably closer to the traditional, but I'm going to start ex explaining a little bit why. And I, I think I've got some scriptures I'd like to share. You guys be the brain. You make your own decisions. Come to your own conclusions. It's not ultra-critical. I would say whether or not the fig tree in the parable or the lesson is Israel is uh, might have been important before 1948, but now it's kind of academic, right? Because Israel is coming into the land. So what we see is in uh, Ezekiel 37, the prophecy there about the dry bones, and you know the old Negro spiritual song is Ezekiel and his dry bones and the foot bones connected to the ankle bone. Now hear the word of the Lord and all that comes from Ezekiel 37. And it's all about, uh, if anybody wants to volunteer and sing that song, you're welcome to. No? No takers? All have to do is look at it. would be pretend I'm a skeleton and going together, pulling together. Yeah. I'll put like an animation together for it. So, uh, so the, that, prophecy for Ezekiel was the whole thing about how they're going to be dispersed at some time. And we know that that happened in um, 70 AD. And the prophecy in Ezekiel 36 and 37 was about how God was going to bring the land back together. And um, uh, son of man, can you make these bones to live? You know, that, that kind of thing. And can these bones be made to live, I guess. And um, so uh, a vision comes to Ezekiel, the Lord shows him bones coming together and flesh goes on the bones and skin goes on the bones and, and the land is is in bloom again, basically. And so that was all a prophecy that ultimately has its fulfillment in the millennium. So a lot of, a lot of prophecies we see are partial fulfillments and then we see the ultimate fulfillment out in the future. And we shared, for instance, about... Uh, um, you know, the abomination of desolation and how this 
we've already seen the prophecy that came from Daniel, and then it was ultimately was fulfilled uh, many, many years later. But then Matthew 24, Jesus talks about, hey, when you see the, ab the abomination of desolation, as if it hadn't already happened. So Jesus is speaking in the future. Um, so then the controversy again coming down to, okay, when is the timing of all this? Because uh, there is a school of thought, the abomination of desolation, well, that all took place in 70 AD. So I hope we've dispelled the timing of all of that. So what we're looking at is, is a, a couple different phrases here. Because I want to, uh, Matthew 24, again, is, is all about the timing. I want to try to zero in on when the timing of the book of Revelation is, and that's why we kind of stopped. Well, is the rapture at chapter 4 of the book of Revelation? Is that when we start seeing things going on because we have no more church? So there's arguments over the timing of, of all this. So I want to, the Matthew 24 thing is really to, to try to settle when that day is. Typically, it's called that day in Bible prophecy. There's a handout there. I don't know if you if you all got it. I'm sure Debbie didn't get it because she wasn't here. Um, and I kind of titled these notes of, of some scriptures, conditions, and events of that day, of the final generation. Um, but sometimes it's called that day. Sometimes the Bible verses will, will refer to it as in those days. And it makes some very specific references of events and conditions and or that generation. So just looking down the list, you're going to have to sometime, um, it's part of your being the Berean thing and the fig tree generation is kind of going through some of these verses. And um, we can just read through this real quick, but uh, you need to actually go and read those verses that are cited because the passages will come together and hopefully you'll see the flow. But for instance, at the top here, Isaiah 10, starting with verse 6, and it, and it references it references um, Ezekiel 38, 12 as well. Um, but it talks about the generation or um, the conditions of the tribulation and what kind of things kick it off, what some of the events are. And then I, Isaiah 10, verse 20 and 21, it says, In that day... And part of what it describes about that day is Israel coming back into the land. So as a that day event before the tribulation, that day also refers to those years, now over 70 of them, right, that encompass the tribulation and the second coming. So the, the question that came up, and it's one of the things that, that Greg was questioning, and I've, I've heard this before, was, well, when do you count uh, that generation? Um who wants to read in Matthew 24 those verses in question? You can start, you can back it up to about verse 30 if you want. Just read that little passage there and go forward about that generation in the fig tree and just read that whole section there for us. 30 through whatever? Yeah. Okay. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the cloud of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Okay, now that's wrapping up the uh, first part or of the second question that Jesus was asking, right? So now Jesus is going to back up again. So we he, he keeps, as we have reiterated, I think, to death in Matthew 24, is that he keeps talking about conditions and then, and then the end. And then this stuff's going to happen, and then there's the end, and then this, and then the Son of Man. So he keeps bringing everything to, to a bunch of series of events, and then says the end. So here he just referred to the end, the second coming again. Now he backs it up again, and he's going to give them some more teaching about the end. Go ahead. Oh, wait, just a minute. Yeah. So that was describing the second coming, not mm -hmm. the rapture. Right. That was okay. that right there. All right. I just wanted to make sure. Yes. Okay. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that the summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the door. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. 
Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Okay, that's good right there. So he tied a couple things together. These things, and that day, this generation, and here the parable of the fig tree. So that's kind of what we're defining because this is the question that happens is how long is a generation, um, is it a specific number of years, or is the generation a group of people, as, as uh, Greg rightly points out, context determines the meaning, and we always need to run to context. In this case, um, that generation or this generation, um, I believe it refers to both. I think it was referring to specific events because he says, uh, that generation will not pass away until we see all these things come to pass. What things? All the things he's been describing in this sermon so far, right? So from the beginning of those things all the way to uh, this generation won't pass away. And then we're going to see one of the things that was included is, as Hillary just read it in verse 30 was the second coming. So that generation or these things is everything from the, the, the things he described from the beginning of the sermon all the way through the coming of the Son of Man or coming in glory, the second coming. So that's the generation. That's the, the whole thing. So I would maintain that. And I would maintain um, that the generation would start with Israel becoming a nation. And here's the reason why I would maintain that. Um, Part of the reason why I would maintain that, and again, I want to reiterate, read through the rest of these verses because that this is just the tip of the iceberg, and I think it'll hopefully it'll come clear, and then next week we can come back with any questions you have or whatever. Um, but the fig tree has been used emblematically um, for the nation Israel in the Old Testament. Uh, repeatedly. Jesus a couple times before in Matthew and also early in the, the passages or in the book of Luke concerning the same, used the fig tree. Um, at one point he cursed the fig tree and it died because it wasn't producing fruit, that kind of thing. And then that, he was sending a very clear message. So the well, fig just, I'm going to interrupt you. Yeah, Jeremiah shared with you a couple days ago in Jeremiah 24. He says, lesson from the good and the bad thing. And he reiterates, and uh, he's talking to Jeremiah, and he says, the Lord said to me, saying, thus said the Lord of God is real, like the good fig, so I acknowledge those who are carried away captive from Judah. And then the bad ones are the ones that fight the king. So, yeah. yeah I mean, it's very clear, and he says it there. Right. Yeah, this, very few people will question... Um, what the, what the meaning of the fig tree is. The question tends to come down as if the, the fig tree and that generation is the same. Now, what I want you to watch for is we're going to go, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to move forward now in, in, um, on some of these slides is um, what I want you to keep an eye on is generation and how long it is and when that day starts, when those days are, and what some of those conditions are. As we've already read in Matthew, we've, we've already read about the earthquakes increasing and, and, and pestilence and things like this. Um, fig tree, now the question comes, and this is the question is whether or not it's a marker of when Israel comes into the land in 1948, or is it about um, the starting of the, of the tribulation? Or is the fig tree, is it, is it does it mean um, even, yeah, I guess you could, Theoretically, you could push it out and say, well, when he's talking about the fig tree and the fig tree prophecies, you you got to jump all the way ahead to a millennium. So I'm going to go through some verses here. We'll look at some charts. And then um, you kind of come to some conclusions. But that's kind of the thing we're watching for is to find out how long is a generation. There's one thing I want you to keep in mind in, in the back of your mind. And, and there's a reason why I'm headed down the road that I am. Um with the more traditional view, and that is think about all the prophecies that you know in the Bible, and you can use, use Daniel, uh, the 70 weeks prophecy. When you think of prophecies about around the time of Christ, 
How many times does the Bible address things after the time of Christ? What are some of the prophecies that we hear about, which that we read in the Bible, Old Testament or New Testament? What comes to mind? Can you think of some? You mean after Christ leaves? Uh, yeah, after even after heaven. after Christ ascends to heaven. We do. Like times are going to get worse and worse. Those kinds of things. That's very general. Yeah, we know that in the in the end, in those days, and Paul even talked about those days. But what I want to address is that we also know that the the temple being sacked was addressed. 70 AD was addressed. And even the diaspora, the scattering of, of Israel, just generally speaking, that that's when it starts, was addressed even in the Old Testament, right? So now taking roughly um, 70 AD all the way up to the 1900s, can you think of any biblical prophecies that were ever made about that whole stretch in the hundreds and hundreds of years? Well, didn't he say, I think I just read somewhere in Jeremiah, where he's like, um, they'll come back from the land. When, they, when that happened in 70 AD, they were, just, they were slaves locally. But he talks about later on collecting them from all the nations. And that didn't happen back then. So right. we couldn't have collected them from all the nations. Before they'd been captive to the Persians, to the to the Babylonians and so forth, and then the Romans. But at this point, yeah, you're right. In Jeremiah and other passages, and we're going to hit some of those, they're brought back. And that's part of Ezekiel 37 again, the dry bones prophecies. He's bringing them back from all the nations. And that, that is unique. That's the closest you really get, right? So what we have is we have... I want you to look for this language of that day and in those days again. Because what I maintain is that those days or that day or the final generation must necessarily begin with the Aliyah, as the Jews call it, where they're coming back into the land. Uh, and that's all part of the final generation that day. Now, as Greg pointed out too, a lot of a lot of people I think I think I agree erroneously. We'll try to tag a fixed number of years to that generation. The generation can refer to um, a people or a series of events. It can even refer to something. Uh, it's a class of people. It's maybe it's best to put it that way. A class of people or a group of people or certain events. And like Jesus in his wording here says those things. This generation and those things. And he marries them together. So Jesus condemned the Pharisees you know, that wicked, that wicked generation. So he was talking about a specific class of people in their wickedness. And so it wasn't a, a 40 year period or 70 or 80 year period or anything like that. Um, number of years, I think is people have tried that over and over and they're still trying to, to tr jam a certain number of years in there and they take seven years off of the tribulation and people keep trying to do that. And I think that's, that's erroneous for one, for one, reason too i would say is um for instance jesus likens those days as we're getting ready to get into, into as the days of noah and i think i mentioned this before is the methuselah principle as i call it where um that generation as in the days of noah was not supposed to wrap up until methuselah was gone his name roughly means when he's gone it comes so it must have been hard for mom to call him in for dinner time you know we call them win for short or what? I don't know what the original language was, but that's a long name. But that's what, I, and so Methuselah is God's mercy, in, in my opinion, because he was the oldest living man ever. So God gave them every possible length and breadth of time to repent, and they didn't uh, it, until Noah is done with the ark and God led the animals into the ark. Noah didn't call him and he didn't whistle for him or anything like that. God called the animals in, and everybody went inside. Noah and family went inside, and God shut the door. They were sealed by the Lord into the ark. So for me, the Methuselah principle, as in the days of Noah, is God will a generation will be as long as it takes for God's mercy to be revealed that he's been very patient and he's waiting for everybody, every last chance for everybody to repent, change their hearts, come to him. And I say, repent 
hoping that everybody understands that repentance is something the Holy Spirit brings about. The Holy Spirit convicts of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. We read in Matthew. That's part of his ministry. And as a result of seeing their sin, because they're convicted by the Holy Spirit, um, they're brought to repentance because and that's what happens to us. Is we're, we're sorry for our sin because we see God and we see us and we see we need reconciliation. So, and and uh, so anyway, uh, you know that's a whole other story. But and then faith is a gift we find in Ephesians. So God does all the work and with the Holy Spirit and with the work Jesus did on the cross and the Father giving His Son. You see, the whole Trinity is involved in our salvation and bringing us to Christ and converting us. So that's what happens, but that's God's mercy. He's very patient. He's long-suffering. So that's the Methuselah principle, right? So that's why I think one of the things that the days of Noah is that God's that generation is however long it takes for God's mercy, to, or his mercy, his patience to run out or whatever. And he says, okay, we're done here. Now it's judgment on the earth. But before he pours judgment on the earth, as we discussed in First Thessalonians, uh, and the church, the bride of Christ, is you are not appointed to wrath, that that day should um, surprise you or catch you off guard like a thief in the night. Now, we're, we might be surprised when the rapture is, but we're not the ones victimized, if I can put it that way, having a thief come in and break in and steal something. We're that precious commodity, that precious pearl, that precious prize, whatever. For the bridegroom, we're what's stolen stolen out of the world we're the only thing that's um salt and light in the world that the lord is worth keeping is his sheep his the bride of christ and he's going to bring us out and bring judgment upon the world and then we're going to see a, a massive um, revival happen on the earth um, quickly but especially targeting israel because god promised israel like it says in romans 11 um that they would come back to him, and we see that begin to happen in the book of Revelation. So that's kind of a real quick Reader's Digest summary of some of the things we talked about and I'm, and the whole timing of everything that we've discussed. So what I'm hoping we see is that we got the church age, but then there's a point where that generation, that generation or that day starts, and usually the dialogue refers to all these events during the tribulation and all the judgment, but then it goes into the second coming, and it'll also mention things like um, uh, judgment, judgment on the earth, but then we, we will see ultimate judgment too at the great white throne judgment. So you could maybe even extend it out that far, but we at least see it going into uh, some prophecies here and there about the Bema Seat judgment, standing before the Lord and starting his kingdom and bringing everybody into the kingdom and, and how God's going to set up, how Christ is going to set up the kingdom where he refreshes and rebuilds the earth and builds the king's highway and, and the things he's going to do. And he says that day, that day, that day. So it talks about the conditions Jesus is going to bring the kingdom into and we're all going to go into it. Um, so, a lot of those th types of things, especially in the Old Testament, are lumped together. And so that's what I want to get into and look at. So um, let's take a quick look at this. Get this slide here ready. So the beginning of sorrows. Um, again, what we've looked at as uh, some of these conditions, some of these things that are, that are described in the Gospels, false Christ, and you can see how that runs across and matches what is described in Matthew 24, verses 4 and 5, uh, Luke 21, 4, and Revelation 6, 1, 2. So you can see how that's going to work across all the way down. And then we have wars, famines, pestilences, earthquakes. So what we'll do is, and then also cosmic upheaval is, is also mentioned. Now, here are some different emphases, a different emphasis between Luke 21's account and Matthew 24's account. Well, we've gone over before, and this is why I laid so much of this groundwork, so hopefully it's easy, easier to transition now and think this through. Shoot your hand up otherwise if, 
if if not remember how we described before that the narrative in Luke 21 is but before all these so when Jesus is talking in the temple in Luke in that account Jesus is addressing um, a bunch of New Testament believers and I suppose a bunch of more unbelievers as well he's speaking in the temple he had not been banned from the temple yet Christians hadn't been banned from meeting in the temple yet they weren't considered by the Jews a cult yet or whatever people of the way and not allowed to go in um, so in the temple Jesus is addressing a bunch of events and he says but before all these Christ wars famines and earthquakes um, and he says all these are the beginning of sorrows now in Matthew the language is different because he describes all these things in his um, uh, then shall they so the sermon within the temple addressing events in 38 years concerning Jerusalem is a near prediction it's, it's the before signs so Luke 21 is all the stuff it is very much about AD 70 he does talk about the second coming and he does mention some of those things um, now the difference is in Matthew 24 is they leave the temple they go up on the mount itself Jesus is there according to Mark 13 so there with Peter James John and Andrew it says they're, they're named in Mark 13 they're not named in Luke so there he's on the mark on the mount and he says all these are the beginning of the of sorrows then shall they that's in Matthew 24 starting verse 1 and following that's the Sermon on the Mount to them concerning the far future uh, complete fulfillment of those days so that's the the, uh, the after signs um, so to bring it all into focus this is something I appreciate Chuck mister for for these slides and I um, these blue ones here these dark slides I, I snagged from him because he explained it so well so I really appreciate appreciate that and it will be good good to see uh, Chuck Missler and glory someday he went to be with the Lord a couple years back resolving power is um, the example he gave is uh, like for instance when you um, you know you look at stars you think you see one star but it, the closer you get to something or even in the microscope the closer you get how that the resolution comes in comes in sharper more clearly so where you have overlap with Luke 21 and Matthew 24 it's, you see the Luke 21 circle says before these Matthew 24 says and then um, Luke 21 the focus is the um, desolation of Jerusalem in AD 70 and the, the thing that they both share is the beginning of is the beginning of sorrows so Luke is talking about Jesus is talking about the beginning of sorrows but then before these things and he starts talking about 70 AD and Matthew he's talking about the beginning of sorrows but then what's going to happen is he talks about really it's the second desolation of Jerusalem and that's yet future so you have kind of the first generation of, of the church really in um, Luke 21 and then the last generation the final generation that generation of those days in Matthew 24 so looking at all that what what I'd like to do is um, draw your attention to as we look at some of these passages we've got whole swaths of, of history and prophecy concerning those days um, in the Old Testament in the New Testament all the way up to 70 AD and then nothing concerning Israel at all until 1948 happened nothing was prophesied nothing happened I mean there's history things happened you know um, but big major events that are of prophetic import so that dovetails in I would maintain to Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy about that final week now I'm not saying that we're seeing the ultimate fulfillment in these prophecies even from 1948 although that was a very specific fulfillment from Ezekiel 
But the stage is being set now for Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy for that final week, which is the tribulation itself. But meanwhile, the stage has got to set. In other words, before the tribulation can happen, a bunch of things need to get into place, right? Before the play can happen, you've got to get all the players in place. They've got to set the furniture behind the curtain. Um, you know, you've got to get, you've got to get all the, uh, you know, the director's got to get in place. People have to learn their lines. All those, the lighting has to be set. So it's the same kind of thing here now in the world is that these things have to, must come together. Um, one example of resolving power, for instance, when you um, first looked up in the sky as a kid and you'd see a star, you'd say, wow, that's, you know, a pretty star, pretty twinkly star. And then they sent up a big telescope into space, right? And they would focus in on these stars to get a good look at them, resolving powers as they zoomed in on it. You found that that's not a star. Some of these are entire galaxies. <laughs> that's no moon. Some of those that we thought were stars were entirely new galaxies. So that's resolving power. So that's kind of what Chuck Missler was trying to clarify um, regarding the accounts of the uh, all of that discourse. So the same can be said of the summary accounts of the Olivet Discourse messages in Matthew, Mark, and Luke with closer and closer uh, attention and focus on detail comes greater <coughs> clarity. So Luke addresses the Christian Gentiles that were saved, heeding the warning in Luke. So Nero wished to sack Jerusalem. He sent troops there. This is 70 AD, right? Or right before it. So the troops arrived, but Nero, Nero died. Um, three other would-be emperors struggled and lost in their respective coup. Okay. Meanwhile, troops were out there. They were staged, ready to go to sack Jerusalem. But meanwhile, there was this power struggle. That went on. <laughs> so Vespasian left the post to Titus to go back to Rome where he sees power as emperor. It was his, his dad. And uh, it wasn't until months later uh, that his son Titus took over and the siege began in earnest and the city became completely surrounded. So, and then some 10 years later, Titus would end up being, being emperor. But you remember the prophecy, if you, if you want to look there real quick at, at uh, Luke 21. So it's starting in verse 20. Jesus tells them, and here he's speaking within the, the temple to the believing Christians at the time. He says, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart let not those who are in the country enter her, for these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people, um, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So this warning was taken to heart by the Christians. And historians will say that as a result of this prophecy here, the Christians took it to heart. And they say that during this time when you had these would-be emperors struggling this power struggle, they'd surrounded, they were prepared to, to attack, Nero dies, the Christians say, hey, this is like what Jesus talked about in the temple. They said that not one Christian was even killed in the siege of Jerusalem because they took the warning to heart and they head for the hills. And it wasn't until later when the city was completely surrounded and they decided, okay, we finally got our act together, we got a new emperor, and Titus came out there and they completed surrounding Jerusalem, and it was under siege, and um, many, many Jews died. Um, 
the numbers are disputed anywhere from 700,000 to over a million, depending on what source you read. But anyway, a lot. Not as many as World War II, but still quite a few for its day. So the temple was destroyed. It was burned to the ground. The gold within the temple melted into the stone pavement. So all the stones were pried up, just like Jesus prophesied. Not one stone would be left on top of another. They were all pried up with spears, and gold was recovered by Titus, which is one way we know that the so-called Temple Mount is not where the temple was, because those stones on the ground, yeah, those stones on the ground are still there. So, and that's a, um, a really, a really great. There's a really great video out there too um, by. Um, Bob Cornuke, and he wrote a good book called uh, Temple. That's, I think it's just called Temple. But um, he gave a bunch of reasons. For one thing, that the Temple Mount, uh, now um, historians describe, I think it was Josephus described what was above the Temple Mount was uh, uh, Capitolina Alexandria or something like that. So it was, it was where the Romans stayed. It was their barracks, basically. It was on top of the Roman Mount. And they talk about when they marched Paul up or whatever, he's up, marching him up. Yeah, it was a fortress. Yeah, it was a fortress. Uh, so those stones are there. In fact, you've got what they call the Western Wall now that they're praying at. It was probably a, a fortress wall. It wasn't the Temple Wall. When, when Herod rebuilt the Temple, he rebuilt the Temple at the same location as where Solomon's Temple was, right? Mm -hmm. Where was Solomon commanded by God to build the temple? In the city of David. City of David is roughly a quarter mile south of the so-called Temple Mount. So it was a kind of misnamed um, when the Muslims were overthrown and they just either assumed or whatever that that was the, the Temple Mount. That's where the temple was. But but we, as we see here in the text that, and we know historically is that Titus and his soldiers, they took their spears and they pried up all the stones to get at the melted gold that had, from the temple that went down into the ground. And so that's why there's nothing in the city of David right now. It's more new city is built on top of it. So Matthew's account describes trouble, great tribulation, that could not and did not happen in 70 AD. The signs here illustrate the foreshadowing within the 70 AD account in Luke but consummates in Christ's return in glory and um, judgment. This was a, this is another way to illustrate. Again, it's it's the, the dark the blue slide. It's it's another one from Chuck Missler to illustrate uh, the difference between the two two destructions there. So you see. The first desolation, which would be, which is uh, described a little bit in, in um, well, let's, well, let's just start with, with um, Matthew 24. It talks about it a little time. It, it does address it a little bit, but then he says, and then, and then after, and he mentions the, uh, the great tribulation. That's a difference. So that's a then after in the tribulation. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble in uh, Jeremiah. So that's kind of a difference we see there. So the difference is, is that Jesus, when he was describing it in Luke 21, he describes, describes these things, the wars, the famines, the earthquakes, etc. And he says, but before these things, and then he describes the fall of Jerusalem. Um, in Matthew 24, he says, describes those things and says uh, all kinds of things. Then after, describes the Great Tribulation and so forth. So that's just another way. Of, and then he says the, uh, he describes the cosmic upheaval as well. So is that clear enough? Clear as mud? Any questions so far? So, so the question when you look down at, at, this, at the bottom half of the screen, uh, where it's talking about Luke 21 is, is there's no mention of the Great Tribulation here. because So Jesus in the temple did not address it. He did in Matthew 24. So after the events recorded in Luke concerning 70 AD, 
um, the Jews were scattered. Uh, in fact, they, they tried to regroup again within Israel um, in about 135 AD, but the emperor routed them, and it said uh, he plowed part of the city under Edom, and he renamed the land of Israel to Palestine. That's when it became called Palestine. It's about 135 AD, whereupon they scattered into other nations for nearly 2,000 years until World War II. And uh, Domitian was that same emperor in power of what well, uh, John wrote Revelation. So the regathering or restoration into the land of Israel was foretold in the Old Testament, at, um, and as such, it is of great prophetic significance or a sign under specific conditions and miraculous, um, not an average day occurrence as the last days event, as the first major last days event concerning Israel. Although there are clear implications for the church, there's nothing directly addressing the church in, in that prophecy. It's all, it's all about Israel, right? But concerning Israel, there are no predicted sign events between the scattering that began with the fall of, in, uh, of Jerusalem in 70 AD until the miraculous regathering began in the establishment of the nation of Israel in, in 1948. Israel regathered. Let's take a look at some of these. These are significant. So Amos 9 says, uh, in that day, again, see we have that phrase, I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. So clearly that's going to, a time constraint, that's a time thing that's going to happen. Um, you, when Israel started as a nation in 1948, they weren't built. It wasn't green land and territory they walked into. We, we know it was a desert when they walked into it. And prophetically in Amos, it has to be rebuilt. So that shows that that's a foretold prophetic significance of um, rebuilding it. So in Amos, it does talk about basically what starts in 1948. And he refers to that as that day, right? So... You, we know a day is not a literal 24-hour day, but it's part of that significant swath of time in history. But let's keep going. And then he, he jumped down to verse 14 in, in the same passage. He, will, he says, I will restore the fortunes of my people, Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine, and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their land. And they shall never again be uprooted, which is prophetic, right? It's what we see in the Bible is that they, they will never be uprooted. They'll, um, they'll uh, never be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. So uh, they're home. <laughs> and uh, they're, they're still gathering. But again, it, they don't see their ultimate fulfillment until the second coming. And uh, that's when we see... Israel get all their borders. They've been in the land prophetically for a long time, but they've never had all their borders that God promised to Abraham. So there's a nexus point within the Old Testament concerning the very last days, um, prophetic terminology, uh, using phrases such as that day, those days, or there's coming a day. So the terminology focus on events wherein we see events setting up fiery, wrathful judgment, uh, sometimes called vengeance, which reaches a pinnacle at the second coming of Jesus Christ. The time frame or era is with little doubt referred to as a day, not because of all the events will happen within a single 24-hour day, but because they find their culmination as events are aligned by God to that one actual day when Jesus Christ returns. Um, so that is one component. Another component that also kicks off on that actual day is Jesus stepping down to return all creation as it should be. On the Mount of Olives, when uh, the disciples asked Jesus about these things and the end, Jesus defined uh, sign events indicating this nexus point. Although we know Gabriel gave Daniel 70 weeks prophecy to define really Messiah events in particular, Jesus only used the abomination of desolation event to define a pivotal turning point, a time in history. 
in a, a big event, the official start of what Jesus called the Great Tribulation. But that is already halfway into that final week. See, right here in this three and a half days period in the middle of our timeline here. That starts the Great Tribulation. So it's all the Tribulation week, but the final half is the Great Tribulation. And that's the abomination of desolation. Um, therefore, Jesus is not merely pointing to only events addressed in the 70 weeks. So he's talking about events leading up to it. And he talks about events immediately after that prophecy. Um, so Jesus is specifically answering contextually the, the disciples' threefold question. Remember what it was um, in the beginning of the chapter. Tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. So Jesus is answering these in order. So we're at that third part about the end of the age. So um, by the time we get to the lesson of the fig tree in verse 32, Jesus is answering the last part and of the end of the age. Um, the age, the age or the generation, that's another phrase we could use, right? Because he's answering that. So that day, those days, this generation or the age. So it's a very specific time frame and the time frame includes all this coming back into the land and so forth all these all these events so that day and the people of that time in in uh, verse 34 referred to as this generation so jesus responds to uh, set up the age and the generation alive at the time these events occur so the age Jesus refers to in verse 33, and all these things and the people who witnessed these events, because that is what he's talking about, is a specific class or group of people who witnessed these events as this generation. Then he lays out events in which all these things happen, defined as the end of the age, as things that will all happen in a single generation. So important to note is this generation will be the one that, is still alive to see all these things. All what things? Well, all the things he's described up to this time, all the way up through the coming of the Son of Man. So, you know, what are what are those events? So Jesus, remember, to recap, uh, he, he initially points out that it's going to be false Christ and also wars and rumors of wars, but don't be alarmed at these because the end isn't yet. Uh, it's not yet the end. So... Then what is, he says, uh, in verse 7, he says, ethnic wars. Remember, nation against nation, which is ethnos, what, ethnicities. Verse, wait, verse 7 of what? Matthew 24. Sorry about that. And then wars between kingdoms or countries, perhaps world wars. Um, in which our case happened twice. Uh, also, he mentions famines or starvation. Verse 7, he, also he mentions earthquakes in uni unique and diverse places, which we're seeing now, which are, even in today's news, literally. All these in verse 8 are only the beginning. In verse 9, we find that Israel will have to be in place as a nation. That's the clear implication. So that when... Uh, but beginning how far back, that's the question. So the sign in the disciples' second part is, you know, what will be the sign of your coming? Um, that question mark, we can get, uh, let's see, verse 15, uh, the defiling of the temple in the middle of Daniel's 70th week. So they've got to be there, right? But they've been dispersed after 70 AD. So we see the temple's got to be there, which means Israel's got to be in the land. That's got to be part of that prophecy is the implication. Although it doesn't state it outright, you know, you got to have the land there, and you got to have the temple there, and you got to have somebody there to rebuild it and put the temple there. So, by clear implication, that includes Israel coming into the land, which marks off the remaining three and a half years, which is, you know, the, the abomination of desolation. So, this is very, spe very specific as a calendar date for that time and the very unthief like arrival of Christ so that well um, judgment the three and a half years prior as in the flood might catch people unaware unaware to a rapture or the flood might catch people unaware they were surprised you know they felt raindrops in the time of Noah and they what is that is that that stuff Noah was talking about 
Um, by the time you get to the mid-trib and you see the abomination of desolation, now you have a calendar event and you know that you've got three and a half years left. So that's not very thief-like, is it? They were caught unawares like a thief in the night at the rapture, just like when the flood started, those people were caught by surprise. Again, we might be caught by surprise, but no big whoop because whoop, we're taken up and we're delivered to the Lord. So we're what's stolen by the thief. And Jesus is the thief. So judgment will catch people unaware, but the actual second coming will not be a shock or surprise at all. Verse 29 to 31. They'll be able to stick a pin in that in the calendar. Um, it's given in, in chapters 11, 12, and 13 of Revelation, which we'll get to eventually. <laughs> Um, in the term, in terms of days and months and years, it's given in different ways. So, what generation is around to witness all this from the beginning of all these events through the end of, a, of age? Um, some call the fig tree generation. Um, the age or the end correspond to events as the same events the Old Testament will call that day, a day, those days, or the day of the Lord. Yeah, Ezekiel thirty begins with the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy and say, thus says the day of the Lord, wail, alas, for the day, for the day is near, the day of the Lord is near, and it will be a day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations. And that's describing the seven-year tribulation period. That is the tribulation judgment. A seven-year period of time, we will also see that day will include beyond into the establishment of the kingdom. And, of course, we know that order of events is after. Now, the question remains, maybe still in our mind that we need to support and prove is, um, does that day include any time frame prior to the tribulation week? And I, I think hopefully you can see um, the pattern that it is. Look at Jeremiah 30. In Jeremiah 30, let's see, verse 1, let's see the, no, not verse 1. The restoration for Israel, yeah, verse 1, I think. It is. So the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, in verse 2, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, write in the book all the words that I have spoken to you, for behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when what happens? when I will restore the fortunes of my people, just like the earlier passage we read, right? Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will bring them back to the land that I have I gave to their fathers, and they shall take possession of it. Um, see, tribulation for Israel. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. But... He shall be saved out of it. And then salvation for Israel is described beginning in verse 8. And it shall come to pass in that day, declares the Lord, uh, the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off your neck and I will burst your bonds and foreigners shall no more make a servant of him. But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. Questions so far? But hopefully, hopefully it's easier than if we'd never looked at Matthew 24 and set up all those timings and everything before. We, hopefully you can see kind of timeline. Because what we're describing, if you look at this, is, see this right here, that day? That day, in those days, that generation, and so forth, kind of in the purple here. We're in the church age, so the stage is being set here because these are often included. Events before the rapture are included, which includes Israel being restored. They're set up and restored in the land, and they're going to rebuild and all that. That has to happen. And we've got to get that temple before these other events happen. We've got to actually be in the land. So those days, that day has to include Israel in the land. And then it runs out toward here. So he's prophetically, again, we've had nothing about Israel since 70 AD, no Israel prophecy is being fulfilled at all. And all of a sudden, we've got big prophetic events going on in that day. 
does it include Israel coming back into the land? And, and that's what I'm maintaining is that, well, it's got to. It's got to include Israel being established in the land. That's some of the language here. Ezekiel 36, then. The prophecy to the Mount of Israel. And you, son of man, prophesy to the mountains of Israel and say, O mountains of Israel, hear the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God. Because the enemy said of you, Aha, in the ancient heights have become our possession. Therefore prophecy and say, Thus says the Lord God. Precisely because they made you desolate and crushed you from all sides. Remember we said that uh, they plowed Jerusalem under, part of the city under and all that. And it was desolate. It was a wasteland. So that's all post-70 AD. And crushed you from all sides that you became the possession of the rest of the nations. That hadn't happened in the past, right? But it happened up before 1948. And you became the talk in, of uh, an evil gossip of the people. Therefore, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God to the mountains and the hills, the ravines and the valleys, the desolate wastes and the deserted cities, which have become a prey and denizen to the rest of the nations all around, Bedouins and people wandering around through it, right? Therefore, thus says the Lord God, surely I have spoken in my hot jealousy against the rest of the nations and against all Edom. Now, the Edomites are a lot of their Muslim uh, assailants are surrounding them now, attacking them, the so-called Palestinians attacking them, Edomites, who gave my land to themselves as a possession with wholehearted joy and utter contempt that they might make its pasture lands a prey. And then continuing, verse 8 of Ezekiel 36, But you, O mountains of Israel, shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they shall soon come home. Ah, a big prophecy that starts with them coming home. See, it begins with them coming home. That's 1948. For behold, I am for you, and I will turn to you, and you shall be tilled and sown, and I will multiply people on you. So he's talking about he's bringing them home, and now reestablishing the land and making it fertile and, and um, setting them up, right? So it includes all of that. I will multiply you on the whole house of Israel, all, um, all of it. The cities shall be inhabited and the waste places rebuilt. And I will multiply on you man and beast, and they shall multiply and be fruitful. And I will cause you to be inhabited as in your former times and will do more good to you than ever before. Then you will know that I am the Lord. I will let people walk on you, even my people Israel, and they shall possess you and you shall be their inheritance and you shall no longer be, uh, bereave them of children. Son of man, when the house of Israel lived in their own land, they defiled it by their ways and their deeds. Their ways before me were like the uncleanness of a woman in, in her menstrual impurity, so I poured out my wrath upon them, the blood that they had shed in the land for the idols with which they had defiled it. I scattered them, past tense, among nations, and they were dispersed through the countries in accordance with uh, the ways of their ways and deeds, I judge them. Therefore, therefore says, uh, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not your, not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. See, they, see, they came to the nations. They were scattered among the nations. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, even when they were scattered, they're profaning the name of the Lord, right? And which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I will vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries, bringing you into your own land. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. And you shall be my people, and I will be your God, and I will deliver you from all uncleanness, and I will summon 
the grain and make it abundant and lay no famine upon you. And the land that was desolate shall be tilled instead of being the desolation that it was in the sight of all who passed by. 